Final Fantasy III came out a year and a half after Final Fantasy II for Nintendo Famicom in Japan. The Final Fantasy III we got on the SNES is actually Final Fantasy VI. The West didn't get to see Final Fantasy III until 16 years after its initial release, when it was finally remade for the Nintendo DS. I never actually played through the original version. I remember liking the beginning hours of it, and then I played through about half of the DS version. For this video, I really wanted to get back to its original form so that I could fully appreciate everything that this entry did for the Final Fantasy franchise. Right at the start, we get a familiar setup to Final Fantasy 1. Naming your party members. So we're bringing them back. Our heroes are once again, Peeb, Jerd, Joof, and Ian. Only we're babies now. Rather than picking jobs for them at the beginning like the first game, everyone starts off as the affable Onion Kid, which is basically a completely untrained child who stole his dad's armor from the closet and then fell into a pit after playing pretend. That's how it all starts. The party fell into a cavern and need to get out. No noble goal or world altering event, just a big ol' oops, better get home before we get grounded. After making their way through the cave and killing a turtle, the four come across a magnificent crystal. The sentient crystal is the wind crystal and tells them they are actually the four warriors of light and imbues them with power. That power is several new jobs that any character can freely become, allowing the four heroes to once again become a fighter, white mage, black mage, and a monk because Thief isn't available right away. And after exiting the cave, a familiar tune plays, one that was missing from Final Fantasy II. Final Fantasy III marks an important entry, as it's the first time that the traditions of Final Fantasy are set. We got that classic Final Fantasy theme, and even the prelude plays during file select. Once again, there's four warriors of light to save the world, and they have to find all four crystals, each one representing one of the elements. This game brings back several elements from the first game and a couple of the second, bringing them together. Coming. What? Are you sure, dear? Yes, it is! Oh, I love you so much! I love you! Oh, it's coming! Oh, it's coming! You're doing a great job! I just I keep it up! Keep pushing! Oh, here comes the baby! You can do it, dear! We're in this together! I know! Here it comes! Ow! Okay. Oh, it's beautiful! What a, a beautiful baby we had together! Oh, it has both of our best features! I love you! I love you! I'm so proud of you! I'm proud of you too! Are you also proud of us, Dad? I sure am! For all the old things coming back, though, there's one major addition that Final Fantasy III introduces. The job system. Your party members can change and become any job you want whenever you want it. You'll only start off with a few, but as you save crystals, more and more become available. I've said it before, but I'm a sucker for any game with any sort of job system. I love this kind of customization and specialization you can bring to your party members. I always enjoy playing with party makeups, either using my favorites or trying some weird wacky stuff for something different. Final Fantasy III's job system brings about some of the most iconic jobs that are still used to this day, such as the Summoner, Dragoon, and the Dark Knight. Sorry, Mystic Knight. You win this time, Cecil. The jobs added more than just flavor to each class, as they each had their own unique ability. This is a pretty big deal, as for once combat choices were beyond who attacked and who used magic. Thieves could finally steal, dragoons could jump, knights can protect fellow party members, bards can get the f out of my party, and they all have that distinct, now iconic look to them. This visual flair to each job is still used in Final Fantasy games today, cementing Final Fantasy III's legacy in the series' history. Although the rapid change in look is rather silly when you think about it, I mean, just look at Ian. He goes from child to adult white mage to a childlike shaman and then to a however old the sage you interpret to be. I kind of miss the cute ears on him. Even though this offers a wide variety of jobs for lots of party customization, the game doesn't really allow you to, and that's one of my biggest gripes with it. Several areas or encounters require you to have specific jobs for your party or you won't be able to continue. Sometimes, this is neat. Like a few areas where you need to be tiny, making physical attacks awful so a party of magic users makes up for it. Other times, it's so forced it's uninteresting. 
like the boss battle against Garuda, where unless you are a Dragoon and using jump every turn, you're pretty much dead. Or there's this cave where enemies multiply themselves unless they're killed by a Mystic Knight's sword. The Mystic Knight doesn't do anything else that's unique, you just have to be one and fight with it in an otherwise absolutely infuriating dungeon. I really wish I could have just had any party makeup I wanted. I just really wanted to stay as a thief through the whole game again, even though he has the mustache of a math teacher. The job system was good, but it wasn't truly enjoyable until later Final Fantasy games. But Final Fantasy 3 still had plenty of awe-inspiring ideas. This is the first time that the plot of a Final Fantasy game is actually fleshed out. There's more world building, many story arcs, and a fair amount of named NPCs that do more than point you where to go. A lot of them end up joining your party and following around with you, and can even be conversed with for a few extra lines of character development or progression hints. They even get unique sprites to make them a bit more memorable, like Princess Sarah here, or Sid. It's not much, but it does go a long way to feel more connected to them when they leave the party or do something like jump into a furnace to prevent the world from collapsing. Farewell, Desh. You are just too tall for this menu screen box. The overworld is really impressive. You got all the staples right away. Mountains, fire areas, deserts, etc. Then you realize that you're only on a floating island that's actually a small fraction of the massive overworld. You leave that island and find several more islands to discover. Or get lost for several minutes because there's no sense of direction and everything looks the same. Even after exploring all these new places, you can find even more when you dive underwater. This essentially means that there are three overworlds, each of them having a healthy amount of extra areas and side quests for you to discover. Best part is that a lot of these aren't even end game extras. You can get to a lot of these right around the midway point, like getting special equipment or extra summons. Speaking of multiple overworlds, you get so many airships in this game, you can get an airship within the first 30 minutes. And that one doesn't last, but soon you'll get another airship to leave the first continent. And that one also does not last. Eventually, you get the Nautilus airship, which is crazy fast and is the one that lets you go underwater. But the best airship in any Final Fantasy game ever is this slow behemoth right here. The Invincible. What makes it so great? One, it can do this. And even better, during air battles, your own ship will sometimes blast the enemy party with its cannons, and it's awesome! Smooth out battle system aside, I was also rather pleased with how well paced Final Fantasy 3 is. At no point did I need to grind, even after switching jobs and having no job levels in them. Battles were quick and fluid, and bosses were never so overwhelming that it felt impossible to tackle aside from the forced job fights. But Unlike Final Fantasy 2, I never felt so overpowered that battles became boring. Also unlike Final Fantasy 2, the dungeons don't suck. They're not confusing labyrinths with bullshit dead ends. There's plenty of side paths which lead to treasures and quite a few of them even have more hidden rooms through fake walls, making it worthwhile to check everywhere. These improved designs really elevate Final Fantasy 3, especially with the fact that you don't have to grind at all. I was wrong! I take back everything I said about good dungeon design and the lack of grinding. The entire end of this game is the exact opposite of all of all those things. The smooth, enjoyable ride for a good 20 hours gets completely thrown out the window from the 30th story and into a wood chipper. The final boss fight with Zand, the main enemy, opens up with him blasting your ass with Meteo out of nowhere. Dead. The only way to survive it is to have enough hit points to survive, which takes leveling up a bunch. And Zant isn't even the actual final boss. He was controlled by Cloud of Darkness, the more evil bad guy. Way to start that trope, three. But that is nothing to the final dungeon, the infamous Crystal Tower. Not only is it several floors filled with the most dangerous enemies in the game, you have to face four full bosses that have plenty of instant kill spells before you stand a chance against the actual end boss, Cloud of Darkness. And if you die against any one of these bosses or even the random battles, you go back to the start. There is no extra save point in here. It takes 
hours to get all the way back up, defeat all the bosses, and then fight Cloud of Darkness. If that wasn't enough, Cloud of Darkness might be the worst final boss in Final Fantasy. She does one thing, Flare Wave, which deals over 1500 damage every turn. That's it. And when you only have just over 3000 hit points, you're not gonna survive that long. The only way to have enough hit points is to grind. No amount of tactics will matter, just get levels. And much like a lot of the previous boss fights, the last one is practically designed for you to use two hidden super jobs to win, the Sage and the Ninja. But to get them, you have to go down into another couple hour long dungeon, obtain them, get back out, and then grind some levels for them. It comes down to using the Ninja to throw shurikens for a lot of damage and using the Sage to heal. Everything else will die. There is nothing interesting about this fight. It's boring, it sucks, it's a lame boss reveal, and the entire end game tacks on an easy extra five hours of bullshit. That is, assuming you don't die and have to do it again. Oh, it was doing so well until now. Mostly. These problems are with the Famicom original. It's slightly better in its 3D remakes. The first remake it ever got was for the Nintendo DS in 2007. The same 3D version was eventually ported to PSP, to iOS, and eventually to Steam. It has some improved story bits, the Onion Kids are now named characters, and a lot of jobs and fights got rebalanced. Any of these versions work fine, though I'd say the Steam version works best thanks to the extra options and improved resolution. Just be sure to download a mod to make the interface less horrible. Honestly, either the remake or the original plays well these days. It's hard to recommend one over the other. It comes down to if you want a more classic experience or something slightly more modern. I am glad I played through it in its original form, finally. You can easily see how it set up so many staples for the entire series. It was going really, really smoothly until it slowed down at the end. That's why my final rating for this game is the Invincible out of 10. Every airship before this is awesome and it's super fast and it's exciting and fun. And then the last airship, the Invincible, is just super slow. And that's the whole game. Everything leading up to the end is fun and enjoyable to play, barring a few notable bumps in the road. But once it's at the end of the game, oh boy does it slow down. Decent, albeit familiar story with enjoyable gameplay is offset by completely forced grinding in a way too long of a dungeon that will definitely cause you to get some game overs a few times. I love the job system and absolutely credit this game for creating something wonderful for the series, but this is easily the weakest implementation of it. Don't expect a fully customizable game with boundless possibilities, but rather a hand forcing you down specific paths. Still, it's a good amount of variety outside of those times with party customization. The sheer scope of it is impressive, with multiple overworlds, lots of hidden areas, and extra collectibles. And finally, a plot worth something and isn't just there to drive the gameplay. It's easily the best Final Fantasy of the NES era. Of the original three, I still think the first one is my personal favorite, purely because of nostalgia. This was an enjoyable look back to see how the franchise found its identity through both the good and the bad. Fans of the franchise don't really need to play any of the original three if for no reason other than to see how it all got started. Otherwise, you're fine with sticking with any of the later games. Which is great, because from here is when it starts getting really good.